go crazy. Okay, so Warren C. Harding as our president, sorry for the two prior things, but we should wrap it up right here, looking at the Republican presidents of the 1920s. The Republican political economy, laissez-faire plus. Warren G's personality you know. Part of his personality is a nice guy, and that allows what happens with his policy. His policy may be entirely wonderful pro-business, but what it really is, is corrupt. And the best way to remember Warren G. Harding on a personal level, policy level, or program level is his corruption. He is so nice, he allows his Ohio gang to come to the White House. Again, the Ohio gang might be the best way to remember Warren G. Harding. Not the team of rivals for Abraham Lincoln. Not the kitchen cabinet for Andrew Jackson. But this group of buddies who come to Washington and use it for their own benefit. A bunch of cigar smoking, big drinking boozers, gambling corrupt guys who inhabit his cabinet and his unofficial set of friends. And they're frankly bad. And they hit and they bring this stench of corruption to, to Washington, D.C. And you'll see the slide, the, the political cartoon tomorrow that kind of illustrates this. The, Ohio gang brings this awfulness to the White House. Shortly after Warren G. Harding himself has kicked his mistress out of the second floor of the White House, onto the lining where she has to escape on her own when his wife actually comes into the bedroom at the White House. Shortly after that, the scandal called the Teapot Dome. I'll give you a CRF article about the Teapot Dome scandal tomorrow. And that Teapot Dome scandal is simply, I'm going to use my office for my private gain. Game. And that transfer of land from the Department of the Navy to the Department of the Interior, where it can be leased to private L.A. businessmen like Sinclair and Doe Amy, that is the kind of corruption that takes place in the Harding administration. I, Albert Fall, Secretary of the Interior, will get boku bucks for getting that transfer to happen. I get rich at the public's expense. It's a bad administration. So Teapot Dome, corruption, Ohio gang, uh, outside of foreign policy are probably, probably the best ways to remember um, Warren G. Harding. Unfortunately, he dies of a heart attack in San Francisco in 1923, and his administration is over. To remember his administration and to characterize his administration are two photographs. One photograph is of the administration lockstep, everybody, exactly in line, all white, all male, all old, all conservative. That laissez-faire plus that Republican political economy. You got Warren G. himself, you got Andrew Mellon, Secretary of the Treasury, extraordinarily rich man, Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Calvin Coolidge, Vice President, they're lockstep conservative, rigid men of that type. Um, I love the picture for that, to demonstrate what we're about in the 1920s. No, more, no longer any moral purposefulness of the, of the, 19, of the 19 progressive era. This is new and different. And then this, this fascinating uh, photograph of the same administration, same cabinet, after the death of Warren G. with this kind of pallid Calvin Coolidge as president, the near death Andrew Mellon, and there's some very interesting characters in the back. That's why I show it. The, I'm very happy now I can be in power. Um, the, I'm really disgusted with anybody who's not rich like me. Uh, I'm very eager to make more money at the expense of poor people. And then, I, is that Mr. Maynard? No, Mr. Piss? No, Mr. Kurt? I'm not sure. Isn't that me with the outfit the guy sitting there? So we have the um, great photograph of the Harding administration. Now, Harding will die and pass it off to his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. And Calvin Coolidge, as you can see on the board, is president from 1923 to 1928. If anyone continues the Republican political economy of laissez-faire plus, it's Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge says, the man who builds a factory builds a temple of worship. The man who works there prays there. 
To equate the building and work in a factory with that of a place of religious worship? That's an amazing statement. He also said the business of America is business. That's Calvin Coolidge. More personality Calvin Coolidge. You see him here very much the conservative family man from New England. He is as silent as you can possibly be as a human being. He doesn't talk. A man of very few words. Taciturn is a good vocab word to describe this New Englander who seems to have been weaned on a pickle. Um, he is simply known as Silent Cow. He's a man of extraordinary honesty, uh, a man of, of New England principles of stern discipline, honor, integrity, hard work, all of those good things that make us who we are as Americans. Um, but a man who simply did not say anything. In fact, the, the famous story of the young socialite woman in New York with the president coming to her house for dinner had concocted, had come up with a plan to get him to speak. And she knew she could do it. She had him all set up where that he was going to actually talk and say a lot. So it, she had the plan set. She was ready to go. They're at the dinner table. They're at the, the party ready, ready for it. She hatches, launches her plan. She goes, Mr. President, I bet, I bet I can make you say more than two words. And he turns to her and says, you lose. Over. So this incredible man who loved business was a market change to the Harding administration. And we boo. For those years of his administrations, it is an amazing, amazing economic uh, takeoff that we have. Um, look at that economic takeoff. Really brief, briefly, right here, look at it. Government is no longer regulated. Government is assisting. What else do we have? You'll see tomorrow in class. Everything that makes for fun of the 1920s makes for money of the 1920s. What do we have? A new industry called film. A new industry called radio. A new industry called sport. A new industry called auto. Wow! Look at each one of those and understand how each booms our economy in the 1920s. Now on Tuesday we'll explore more about this economic growth. But just look at the automobile itself. What does it do to new existing industries and the creation of new industries? Automobile is its own industry. Look at what, look at what um, Henry Ford does with the assembly line. He makes the production of the Model T so inexpensive that his own factory worker can afford to buy one. And the great advertisement was, he can buy one in any color as long as it's black. And the worker in the factory can buy the factory product. That's Henry Ford. That's assembly line. That's factory work in the 1920s. But that automobile not only is a new industry where it can take off, but look at the associated industries. Steel takes off. Oil takes off. Rubber takes off. Glass takes off. Tourism takes off. Road building takes off. Look at each one of those just in the auto industry boom that happens in the 1920s, and you see this incredible growth of our economy under the stewardship of Simon Cap. Amazing, amazing time. A man of few words at the end of his second administration says, I don't want to really talk. I'm going to invite a few reporters up to my New Hampshire house. I will write out little cards that say, I choose not to run for re-election, and I'll hand those out. That's what Silent Cow does in 1928 to announce his not running for the president. And then finally, the presidency will take, be taken over by the perfect, the perfect steward, the Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge. Uh, seen here with Silent Cow. Seen here with Andrew Mellon the Secretary of the Treasury for those administrations. And then there's Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce for the Harding and Coolidge administration. And we all in 1928 say, what better person? This man is amazing. He's perfect to take over. In fact, the campaign slogans are interesting. A chicken in every pot, a car in every garage. That's what Hoover can promise based on the Republican administrations in the 1920s. 
In fact, he actually says during the campaign, we are closer to the complete elimination of poverty than at any time in world history. A sad irony given what's going to happen within a year of his taking office. Um, Herbert Hoover is again a Republican, again 28 to 32. And as far as personality, a fascinating individual. That jovial, rigid, look at the collar, very high collar, kind of person is who he is. If there's a way of describing his personality, his policy, his program, it's rugged individualism. Rags and riches, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, make yourself powerful and rich on your own. And his life story is that. Orphaned at a young age in Indiana, this guy takes over a dry goods store and makes money out of it. He's a profitable young man who says, now I want to go to Stanford and learn mining and engineering and turn that into millions upon my entry into that field. Absolutely amazing. Uh, a good career at Stanford, uh, one bad incident when he, as the manager of the football team, travels by train with the team up to Berkeley for the inaugural big game. Very important to you know what big game is. And that inaugural big game, the guys are warming up, ready to play the game, and they turn to Herbert and say, where's the football? And he said, I forgot it. He hops on the horse, has to ride into downtown Berkeley to get a football to play the game. Also, for Herbert, obviously, is one of the uh, worst names, second worst name in American presidential history. Uh, Hi, I'm Millard Fillmore. Nice to meet you. Hi. Well, what is Herbert's like? Hi, I'm Herbert Hoover. Hi, I'm nice to meet you. I'm Herbert Hoover. And so, Hoover is the self made man. Hoover believes in that and perpetuates that while he's in office to the extent that he can. Um, Unfortunately for him and the nation, within a year of his taking office, we are hit by the a cataclysmic economic downturn. Um, one that's only been rivaled by the one in 2008 since then. And you'll see on Tuesday his response to that cataclysmic downturn. Um, but very definitely in the 1920s, as you'll see tomorrow, we're having fun and we're making money. Understand the dynamic, fascinating role that these three presidents played in that story in the 1920s, and um, we'll convene tomorrow.